From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays, transcribed with John Chapman. Plays, a series of hour-length dramas based on famous theatrical books begun by the late Burns Mantle, now edited by the distinguished drama critic of the New York Daily News, John Chapman. Mr. Chapman. Good evening. Somehow, I hesitate to describe the best play we are presenting here as a psychological melodrama because that phrase doesn't have the punch it used to have. It seems to me that it used to mean a play or a movie that was enormously exciting but still intelligent. It was a thriller that made sense and didn't have to rely on sliding panels, clutching claws, and all of the other machinery of the old-time Meller. But from what I've seen lately, on the stage at least, and a good bit of the time in the movies, a psychological melodrama is a melodrama in which nothing happens. Since nothing has happened, I go right home to bed and sleep like a practically toothless baby. But that wasn't the case on the night of December 5th, 1941, when I saw the first performance of Patrick Hamilton's Angel Street. A great deal happened in that play, even though it was psychological. It was so psychological, in fact, that it kept my head whirling for hours. What a cunning and cruel devil that Mr. Manningham was. And how clever was that very dull-looking man from Scotland Yard, Sergeant Ruff. And what a terrible time that frail, beautiful Mrs. Manningham had had. This was indeed a best play, and it was staged and acted to perfection. For our performance now, we have the original Mr. and Mrs. Manningham. Vincent Price has had many fine roles on the stage and in the films, and this ranks as one of his best. Judith Evelyn, who was one of our best actresses, won stardom in Angel Street. This season, she had the leading feminine role in another psychological thriller, and a good one this time, The Shrike. And for Sergeant Ruff, we are happy to have Melville Cooper, one of the best actors Britain ever sent us. The players are ready now, and it's time to begin. <laughs> London, 1880. The living room of a house on Angel Street. The room is murky with that rather terrifying darkness of the late afternoon. The zero hour, as it were, before the feeble dawn of gaslight and tea. In front of the fireplace on a sofa, Jack Manningham is stretched out and sleeping heavily. Sitting quietly nearby is his wife, Bella. Once she might have been called beautiful, but now she has a haggard, frightened air about her. There is a knock at the door, and Bella rises to answer it. Did you ring, madam? I thought I heard the muffin man go by just then, Elizabeth. I suppose you're terribly busy. Oh, no, ma'am. I'd like so much to have some muffins with tea. Would you mind? Not at all, ma'am. Gladly. Anything else, ma'am? Well, that's all. But please close the door gently. The master's asleep. Oh, to be sure, ma'am. Bella, what are you doing? Well, nothing, dear. Don't wake yourself. What are you doing, Bella? Come here. Well, the, uh, muffins for tea. I, I only sent Elizabeth for muffins. Why are you so apprehensive, Bella? I was not about to reproach you. No, dear, I know you won't. The fire's in ashes. Ring the bell, will you, Bella, dear, please? Is it merely to put coal on, my dear? I can do that. Now then, Bella, we've had this out before. Be so good as to ring the bell. But, dear, Elizabeth's out in the street. Let me do it. I can do no, it. No, 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 no. Where's the girl? Let the girl come up if Lizzie's out. Oh, Jack, please spare me that girl. Don't call her in. Ring the bell, please, Bella. Now, come here. What do you suppose the servants are for, Bella? To serve us, I suppose, Jack. Precisely. Then why do you... I think we should consider them a little, that's all. Consider them? <laughs> There's your extraordinary confusion of mind again. You speak as though they work for no consideration. 
I happen to consider Elizabeth to the tune of 16 pounds per annum and the girl 10, 26 pounds a year, all told. And if that is not consideration of the most acute and lively kind, I should like to know what is. Yes, Jack, I expect you're right. I have no doubt of it, my dear. It's sheer weak-mindedness to think otherwise. Did you ring, sir? Yes, we rang the bell, Nancy. Well, go on, my dear. Tell her why we rang the bell. Oh, yes, we, we want some coal on the fire, Nancy, please. Very well, madam. And after you do that, Nancy, you may as well light the gas. This darkness in the afternoon is getting beyond endurance. Yes, sir. You're looking very impudent and pretty this afternoon, Nancy. Do you know that? Oh, I don't know at all, sir, I'm sure. And what is it, another broken heart added to your list? I wasn't aware of breaking any hearts, sir. I'm sure that's not true. And that complexion of yours, that's not true either. <laughs> I wonder what mysterious lotions you've been employing to enhance your natural beauty. I'm quite natural, sir, I promise you. What are your secrets? Perhaps you could pass them on to Mrs. Manningham and help banish her pallor. She would be most grateful, I have no doubt. I'd be most happy to, I'm sure, sir. Or are women too jealous of their discoveries to pass them on to a rival? I don't know, sir. Will that be all you're wanting, sir? Yes, that's all I want, Nancy. Except my tea. It'll be coming directly, sir. Oh, Jack, how can you treat me like that? But, my dear, you're the mistress of the house. It was your business to tell her to put the coal on. No, it isn't that. It's humiliating me like that. That girl laughs at me enough already. Laughs at you? What an idea. What makes you think she laughs at you? I know that she does in secret. In fact, she does so openly, more openly every day. But, my dear, if she does that, does not the fault lie with you? You mean that I'm a laughable person? I don't mean anything. It's you who read meanings into everything, Bella, dear. I wish you weren't such a perfect little silly. Now come here and stop it. I've just thought of something rather nice. What is it, Jack? What have you thought of? I read here that Mr. McNaughton, the celebrated actor, is in London for another season. Yes, I read that. What of it, Jack? What of it? Well, what do you suppose? Oh, Jack, do you mean it? Would you take me to see McNaughton? You wouldn't take me to see McNaughton, would you? I not only would take you to see McNaughton, my dear, I'm going to take you to see McNaughton. <laughs> that is, if you want to go. Oh, Jack, what heaven, what perfect heaven. You can see him in comedy or tragedy, oh. according to your choice. Which would you prefer, Bella, the comedy or the tragedy? Oh, it's so hard to say. Which would you choose if you were me? Well, that depends, doesn't it, upon whether you want to laugh or whether you want to cry? Oh, well, I want to laugh. But then I should like to cry, too. Oh, Jack, dear, what made you decide to take me? Well, my dear, you've been very good lately, and I thought it would be well to take you out of yourself. Oh, Jack, dear, it's true, it's true. All I need is to be taken out of myself. Just some little change. To have some attention from you. I could really try to be better. If only I could get out of myself a little more. How do you mean, my dear, exactly better? Well, you know in what way, dear, about all that's happened lately. Let's not speak about that. No, dear, I don't want to be gloomy, dear. That, that's the last thing I want to be. I, I only want you to understand. Say you understand. Well, my dear, don't I seem to? Haven't I just said I'm taking you to the theater? No. <laughs> well, which is it to be, Bella, the comedy or the tragedy? Oh, which shall it be? It matters so little. It matters so wonderfully little. I'm going to the play. <laughs> Do you understand that, my husband? I'm going to the play. <laughs> I brought your tea, sir. Oh, put it on the table, Nancy. Just as you wish, madam. Tell me, Nancy, if you were being taken to the theatre and had to choose between comedy and tragedy, which would you choose? Oh, I'd go for the comedy all the time. Well, why would you choose the comedy, Nancy? I like to laugh, madam, I suppose. Well, I dare say you're right. I must bear it in mind. Mr. Manningham's taking me next week, you see. Oh, yes? I hope you enjoy it. Will that be all, madam? You may go, Nancy. Yes, sir. You seem wonderfully pleased with yourself, Bella, dear. I must take you to the theater more often if this is the result. Oh, Jack, I wish you would. Do have your tea now. <laughs> I used to adore these muffins as a child. We haven't had them since we've been married, have we? Or have we? Jack? I don't know, I'm sure. I don't know. Bella. What is it? What's the matter? I have no desire to upset you, Bella, but I have just observed something that is very much amiss. If you will rectify it at once while I am not looking, we will assume that it has not happened. Amiss? Well, what's amiss? Uh, Jack, please don't turn your back on me. What has happened? Are you trying to make a fool of me, Bella? What oh. I refer to is on the wall behind you. If you will put it back, I will say no more about it. The wall behind me? What? Yes, the picture. The picture's been taken down. 
Who's taking it down? Why is it been taken down? Yes, why is it being taken down? Why indeed? You alone can answer that, Bella. Now, will you please take it from wherever you have hidden it and put it back on the wall again? No, but I haven't hidden it, Jack. I haven't hidden it. Someone else must have done it. Someone else? Are you suggesting that I should play such a fantastic and wicked trick? Oh, no, dear, no, but someone else. Well, certainly the servants would not have done so without permission or instruction. I, I didn't touch that picture. Will you please leave go of me and sit down there? You're mad, Bella, and you don't know what you do. You unhappy wretch, you're stark, gibbering mad like your wretched mother before you. Oh, Jack, you promised you'd never say that again. The time has come, my dear Bella, to face facts. Jack, I'm going to make a last appeal to you. I'm going to make a last appeal. I'm desperate, Jack. Can't you see that I'm desperate? Go on, say what you wish to say. I may be going mad, like my poor mother. But if I am mad, you've got to treat me gently. Jack, I never lie to you knowingly. If I've taken down that picture from its place, I've not known it. I've not known it. Jack, if I steal your things, your rings, your, your keys, your pencils and your handkerchiefs, and you find them later at the bottom of my sewing box, as indeed you do, then I do not know that I've done it. Jack, if I commit these fantastic and meaningless mischiefs, so meaningless... Why should I take down a picture from its place? If I do all these things, then I'm certainly going off my head. I must be treated kindly and gently so that I may get well. You must bear with me, Jack. Bear with me. I'm trying, Jack. I'm trying. Please believe that I'm trying and be kind to me. Better, my dear, have you any idea where that picture is now? I, I suppose it's behind the cupboard. Would you please go and see? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's here. Then you did know where it was, Bella. No, I only suppose it was because it was found there before. It was found there twice before. <laughs> now, Bella, as I said a moment ago, we have got to face facts, and that is what we have got to do. I'm not going to say any more about it at the moment, for my feelings are running too high. In fact, I am going out immediately, and I suggest that you go up to your room and lie down for a little in the dark. Oh, no, not to my room. Please, don't send me to my room. There is no question of sending you to your room, Bella. You know perfectly well you may do exactly as you please. Now, my dear, I, I'm going to leave you in peace. Have you got to go? Must you always leave me alone after these dreadful scenes? Now, no argument, please. I had to leave you in any case after tea. I'm merely leaving a little earlier, that's all. Oh, by the way, Bella, I shall be passing the grocer, and I may as well pay that bill of his and have it done with. Where is it, my dear? I gave it to you, didn't I? Yes, dear, it's on the secretary. Where is it, my dear? Is it in one of these drawers? No, it's on the top. I put it there this afternoon. Well, are you sure, dear? There's nothing here except some writing paper. Jack, I'm quite sure it is there. Will you look carefully? Oh, all right, my dear, all right. I'll find it. Uh, no, it's not here. It must be in one of the drawers. No, it is not in one of the drawers. I put it up there on the top. Are you not going to tell me it's gone? Are you? Will you I calm yourself? Where is it? Now, where is it? Oh, now you're going what to say new I trick is this you're playing uh, upon it me? It was there this afternoon. I put it there. This will is a plot. This is a filthy plot. Will you control yourself? Will you control it? yourself? <laughs> now, you listen to me, madam. If you utter another sound, I'll knock you down and take you to your room and lock you in darkness for a week. I've been too lenient with you, and I mean to alter my tactics. Help me, Jack. Please help now me. Now listen to me. I'm going to leave you here until ten o'clock. In that time, you will recover that paper and admit to me that you have lyingly and purposely concealed it. If not, you will take the consequences. Jack, Jack, please be patient with me. If I'm mad, be patient with me. I have me. been patient with you and controlled myself long enough. It is now for you to control yourself. Think upon that, Bella. Oh, Jack. Jack, don't go... Jack, you're still going to take me to the theater, aren't you? What a question to ask me at such a time. No, madam, emphatically, I am not. You play fair by me, and I'll play fair by you. If we are going to be enemies, you and I, you will not prosper, believe me. Jack! Oh, Jack! <laughs>
Adam. Yes. What is it, Elizabeth? There's somebody called, ma'am. Who oh, is it? I don't want to be disturbed. It's a gentleman, madam. He wants to see you. Oh, tell him to go away. I want to be left alone. Madam, I think you ought to see him. No. Will you please come in, sir? Elizabeth, no, I'm not fit to be seen. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Manningham. Huh? How are you, Mrs. Manningham? Well, how do you do? I, I'm very much afraid. No doubt you've come to see my husband. Oh, on the contrary, I've chosen this precise moment to call when I knew your husband was out. You may go, Elizabeth. Yes, sir. Really, I'm afraid I don't understand at all. Well, you will do so, madam, very shortly. You're the lady who's going off your head, aren't you? Made you say that? Who are you? I'm a police detective. A police detective? Or was, some years ago. In fact, Mrs. Manningham, you have in front of you one who was quite a personage in his day. Now, <laughs> I want you to take a good look at me and see if you're not looking at someone to whom you can give your trust. Why are you here? Well, we'll come to that. Now, I want you to answer several questions for me, Miss Mary. First, how long have you been married? Five years and a little. Where have you lived all that time? Not here, have you? No. First, we went abroad. Then we lived in Yorkshire. Then six months ago, my husband bought this house. Uh, you bought it? Yes, I had a bit of money. My husband thought it was an excellent investment. Does your husband always leave you alone like this in the evenings? Yes, he goes to his club, I believe, and does business. Ah, does he give you a free run of the whole house while he's out? Yes. Well, no. Not the top floor. Why do you ask? Mm. Before I go any further, Mrs. Manningham, I must tell you there's a leakage in this household. You have a maid, Nancy. Yes. Yeah. Well, Nancy walks out of an evening with a young man named Booker in my employ. I live only a few streets away from you, you know. Yes. Well, there's hardly anything that goes on in this house which is not described in detail to Booker, and from that quarter it reaches me. I knew it. I knew that she talked. Mm, I fancy because of her indiscretion, you are going to be heavily in debt to your Miss Nancy. What do you mean? You must explain. Now, shortly, madam. Now, tell me, have you ever been up to the top floor? No, no one goes up there. Ah. Mrs. Manning, I want to ask you a personal question. When did you first get the notion that your reason was playing at tricks? How did you know? Well, never mind how I know. When did it begin? I always had that dread. My mother died insane when she was quite young, when she was my age. But only in the last six months in this house, things began to happen. Uh, you interest me beyond measure. Uh, what things began to happen? I don't know what to say. It all sounds so incredible. But it's when I'm alone at night. I get the idea that, that somebody's walking about up there. Up, up there on the top floor. At night, when my husband's out, I, I hear noises from my bedroom, but I'm too afraid to go up. It never struck you, did it, that it might be your own husband walking about up there? Yes, that is what I thought. But I thought I must be mad. Why did you think it was he? It was the light, the gas light. In this house, I can tell everything by the light of the gas. You see that mantle there? Mm-hmm. And now it's burning full. But if an extra light went on in the kitchen or, or someone lit it in the bedroom, then this one would sink down. Yes, insufficient pressure. Hmm. But every night after he goes out, I find myself waiting for something. Then all at once I, I look round the room and I see that the light is slowly going down. I go up to my bedroom, but I don't stay there because I hear noises overhead. I want to scream and run out of the house. I sit here for hours, terrified waiting for him to come back. And I always know when he's coming, always. Because suddenly the light goes up again. And then ten minutes afterwards, I hear his key in the lock. And he's back again. I think you've made a very remarkable discovery. One which may have very far-reaching consequences. Far-reaching? How? Well, now, let's leave that alone for a moment. Tell me, that's not the only cause, is it, which has lately given you reason to doubt your sanity? Now, don't be afraid to tell me. Yes, there, there are other things. It, it's been going on for so long, this business of the gas has just brought it to a head, but it seems that my mind and my memory are beginning to play me tricks. Tricks? What sort of tricks? Mr. Manningham gives me things to look after, and when he asks for them, they're gone and can never be found. I have the place for them, and he will find them lying hidden at the bottom of my workbox. Only today, before you came, that, that picture had been taken down from the wall and hidden. 
Now, who could have done it but myself? I try to remember. I break my heart trying to remember. But I can't. And then there was that terrible business about the dog. Dog? Yes. We have a little dog. A few weeks ago, it was found with its paw hurt. He believes... How can I tell you what he believes? That I had hurt the dog. Oh, no. He keeps it in the kitchen, and I'm not allowed to see it. So I begin to doubt, don't you see? I begin to believe that I imagine everything. Huh? Perhaps I do. Are you here? Is this a dream, too? I assure you, you are not dreaming, madam. Mrs. Manningham, did you ever hear of the cabman's friend? The cabman's friend? Yeah, her name was Barlow, Alice Barlow. She was an old lady of great wealth and decided eccentricities. In fact, her principal mania in life was the protection of cabmen. She provided these men with shelters, clothing, pensions, so forth. And that was her little contribution to the sum of the world's happiness, or rather, her little stand against the sum of the world's pain. It was not my privilege to know her, but it was my duty on one occasion to see her. That was when her throat was cut open. She lay dead on the floor of her own house. Oh, horrible. You mean she was murdered? Yes, she was murdered. Murder was never discovered, but the motive was obvious enough. Her husband had left her the Barlow rubies, and it was well known that she kept them without any proper precautions in her bedroom on her upper floor. But I do Murderer seemed to have got in about ten in the night and stayed till dawn. There were only a few trinkets taken, but the whole house had been turned upside down. In the upper room, even the cushions of the chairs were ripped up with his bloody knife, and the police decided it must have been the work of a revengeful maniac as well as a robber. I had other theories, but oh, I was nobody then and not in charge of the case. And was the man never found? No, Mrs. Manning, the man was never found. Nor have the Barlow rubies ever come to light. Well, then perhaps he found them after all and may be alive today. I think he's almost certainly alive today, but I don't believe he found what he wanted. That is, if my theory is right. Then the jewels may still be where the old lady hid them? Mrs. Manningham, if my theory is right, the jewels must still be where she hid them. And do you conceive it possible, Mrs. Manningham, that that man might never have given up hope of one day getting the treasure which he could not find the night of the murder? Yes, yes, possibly. But what has this to do with me? Can you conceive that he may have waited years, gone abroad, got married even, until at last his chance came to resume the search begun on that terrible night? Yes. You know, Mrs. Manning, the old theory that the criminal always returns to the scene of his crime? Yes. Yes, but in this case there's something more than that morbid compulsion. There's real treasure there to be unearthed if only he can search again, search methodically, without fear of interruptions, without causing suspicion. How would he do that? Don't you think... Huh? What's the matter, Mrs. Manning? Quiet. Be quiet, he's come back. Look at the light. It's going down. Wait. There. He's come back, you see. He's upstairs. Now. Yeah, me, that's very odd, that is. Very odd indeed. He's in the house, I tell you. You must go. You know you're here, you must go. How dark it is, you could hardly see to read. Go, he's in the house, please, quiet, go. Quiet, Mrs. Manningham, quiet. You've got to keep your head. Don't you see my meaning yet? Don't you understand that this was the house? House, what house? The old woman's house, the house here, these rooms, these walls. Fifteen years ago, Alice Bardo lay dead on the floor in this room. Fifteen years ago, the man who murdered her ransacked this house but could not find what he sought. What if he's still searching, Mrs. Manningham? What if he's up there, still searching? But my husband, my husband is up there. Precisely that, Mrs. Manningham, your husband. You see, I'm afraid you're married to a tolerably dangerous gentleman. The idea is mad. I've been married five years. How can you imagine my husband is what you imagine he may be? Why, ma'am, because I was on the case when the police came to this place 15 years ago. You can understand there's a great deal of routine work to be done, interviewing your relatives, friends, and so forth. Well, most of that was left to me. Well? Among those I interviewed was a young man of the name of Sidney Power. Power? Sidney Power. Conveys nothing to you? Power? No. Hmm. He was a kind of distant cousin. The only thing was that I remembered his face. Well, I saw that face again just a few weeks ago. It took me a whole day to recollect where I'd seen it before, and at last I remembered it. Well, what if you did remember it? Yeah, well, what startled me was the lady on his arm and the locality in which I saw him. Who was the lady on his arm? You were the lady on his arm, Mrs. Manningham, and you were walking down this street. You mean 
you think my husband, my husband is this Mr. Paul? Well, if my theories are correct. But what are you saying? You stand there talking riddles. You're so cold. You're as heartless and cold as he is. No, Mr. Manning, I'm not cold and I'm not talking riddles. I'm just trying to preserve a cold and calculating tone because you are up against the most awful moment in your life. And your whole future depends on what you're going to do this next hour. Nothing less. You've got to strike for your freedom and strike now. The moment may not come again. Strike? Mrs. Manningham, you are not going out of your mind. You are slowly, methodically, systematically being driven out of your mind. And why? Because you're married to a criminal maniac who steals back to his own house at night, still searching for something he could not find 15 years ago. These are the facts, wild and incredible as they seem. Now, every night for the last few weeks, he has entered his house next door from the back, climbed to the roof and come into his house by the skylight. I know that because I've watched him. Mrs. Marion, so far I'm only dealing in guesses and half facts. I've got to have evidence and that's why I, I've come to see you. You've got to give me the evidence or help me find it. But this is my husband, don't you understand? This is my husband. You must go. I, I must think this out. You... I must cling to the man I married, mustn't I? Oh, indeed, cling to him by all means. But do not imagine you are the only piece of ivy on the garden wall. You can cling to him if you desire, as his fancy women in the low resorts of the town cling to him. This is the sort of wall you have to cling to, ma'am. Women, what are you suggesting? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm only telling you what I've seen. He comes to life at night, this gentleman upstairs, in more ways than one. I've made it my business to follow him in some of his less serious excursions, and I can promise you he has a taste in unemployed actresses which he's at no pains to conceal. Thank heaven, what am I to believe? Madam, do I have your trust? What do you want me to do? What do you want? I want his papers, Mrs. Marion, his identity. Papers? I know of no papers, unless his desk. It's there, but he keeps it always locked. I've never seen it open. Very well, you should see it open now. Do you mind if I take off my coat? Mrs. Manningham, one of the greatest regrets of my life is that fate never made me one of two things. One was a gardener and the other a burglar. Both quiet occupations. You know, as for burglar, I think if I'd started young and worked up my way, I, I, I should have been a genius. But you must not touch his desk. He'll know what you've done. Not if we are clever enough. You see, Mrs. Manningham, oh, there are always... Haven't you noticed something? Look, can't you see the light? It's going up. He's coming back. He's coming back and you must go. Oh, bless my soul. This looks as if the unexpected has ended in. Very well. You must ring for Elizabeth. Well, why do you want Elizabeth? There's no time to waste. Ring for Elizabeth, madam. Very well, but you must go. Please, please. All go. in good time. Now, he's not going to jump in through the window, you know. In fact, he can't be around the front door in less than five minutes. Unless he's a magician. Please, please go. Yes, madam. Ah, Elizabeth, come here, will you? Yes, sir. Elizabeth, uh, you and I have got to do a little quite calm but rather quick thinking. Now, you told me you're anxious to help your mistress, Elizabeth? Why, yes, sir. I told you I was, sir. Now, are you anxious to help her blindly without asking any questions? Yes, sir, but you see... Now, come now, Elizabeth. Are you or are you not? Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, Elizabeth, Mrs. Manning and I have reason to suppose that about five minutes' time the master is returning to this house. He mustn't see me leaving. Now, would you be good enough to take me down to your kitchen and hide me away for a short space of time? You can put me in the oven if you like. Yes, sir, but now, you, you see... Must go, you must go. He won't see you if you go now. Yeah, what were you saying, Elizabeth? You could come to the kitchen, sir, but Nancy's down there, sir. Ah, uh, yes, we'll find another place. Uh, where are you going to hide me, Elizabeth? Through the door behind you, sir, is where he dresses, where he keeps his clothes. There's a big wardrobe there at the back. Ah, it'll have to suffice, yes. Now, we really have to hurry. Get off to bed, Mrs. Manning, quick. And you, Elizabeth, get back to your work. To bed? Am I to go to bed? Yes, yes, and quickly. But if I go to bed... Will you go in heaven's name? Then... There's not a second to spare. Oh. Hurry! Did you ring, sir? Yes, I did. Where is Mrs. Manningham, Elizabeth? I think she's gone to bed, sir. I think she had a headache and went to bed. Oh, indeed. And how long has she been in bed, do you know? She went just a little while ago, sir. I think, sir. Oh, I see. Then we must be quiet, mustn't we? Walk about like cats. Can you walk about like a cat, Elizabeth? Yes, sir. I think so, sir. Very well, then. Walk about like a cat. <laughs> that will be all, Elizabeth. Excuse me, sir. But were you going to have some supper, sir? Oh, yes, I'm going to have some supper, Elizabeth. I'm having it out. I have just come home to change my linen. What did you think about Mrs. Manningham tonight, Elizabeth? What way do you mean, sir? Oh, just as regards her general health. I don't know, sir. 
She certainly seems very unwell. Yes, I doubt if you can guess to what extent she's unwell. Or are you beginning to guess? I don't know, sir. I'm at my wit's end, Elizabeth. You know that, don't you? I expect you are, sir. I've tried everything, kindness, patience, cunning, even harshness to bring her to her senses. But nothing will stop these wild, wild hallucinations. Nothing will stop these wicked pranks and tricks. It seems very terrible, sir. You don't know a quarter of it, Elizabeth. You only see what is forced upon your attention. You have no conception of what goes on all the time. You know, don't you, that I shall have to bring a doctor to see Mrs. Manningham before very long... I've fought against it to the last, but it can't be kept a secret much longer. No, sir. I mean to say, you know what goes on. You can testify to what goes on, can't you? Indeed, sir. Yes. Indeed, you may have to testify in the end, Elizabeth. You realize that, don't you? Yes, sir. I only want to do what's best for both of you. You are a very loyal soul, Elizabeth. And you will be repaid for your loyalty. I only want to serve, sir. Yes. Yes, I know that. Well, Elizabeth, I'm going out. In fact, I'm even going to try to be a little gay. Can you understand that, Elizabeth? Or do you think it very wrong? Oh, no, sir. You should get all the pleasure you can, sir. While you can. I wonder. Yes, I wonder. It's a curious existence, isn't it? Well, good night, Elizabeth. Good night, sir. Good night. Well, now, Elizabeth, the master's safely out of the house, so I think you might go and get Mrs. Manningham. Yes, sir. I'll get her, sir. I was watching from the window and saw him go. Good, madam. Elizabeth... We've been so occupied this evening that the tea things haven't been returned to the kitchen. You'll see to it, won't you? Yes, sir. What did he want? What did he come back for? He only came back to change his clothes, madam. If you need me, madam, I'll be nearby. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, let's have another look at this desk. Let's try this one. There we are. Ah, let's see. Well, doesn't seem to be much here, does it? When she got there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor detective... What's that you have in your hand? What's that you have in your hand? Why, you recognize this? Why, yes. That's my brooch. Is there anything else there? Oh, look, it's my watch. It was also your property, then? It, this watch I lost a week ago. My brooch has been missing three months. And he said he would give me no more gifts because I lost them. He said that in my wickedness I hid them away. Oh, Inspector, is there anything else? Is there a bill there? Is there a grocery bill? Grocery bill? No, no, it doesn't seem to be. Perhaps in the second drawer. No. Doesn't seem to fit, does it? Has it ever been opened to your knowledge? I think he has a special lock on it. Well, well, we just have to force it. But you must not do that. What shall I say to my husband when he comes back? I have no idea what you will say when he comes back, Mrs. Manningham, but then I have no idea what you will do if I have no evidence to remove you from his loving care. I'm afraid. What can I do? There's only one thing to do. I'm going to force it and gamble on finding something. Are you with me? No, but don't you see that? All right, all right, force it, force it, but be quick. <laughs> ah, now, let's have a look. Is there anything here? Ah, there well, anything here? Oh, Mr. Manningham, Mr. Manningham, <laughs> letters, papers, that, no. No, we've lost our gamble. Nothing we want here. What are we going to do? Well, first, let's get these things back to begin with. The watch? Yes, no, here. Sir. The brooch? Yes, here it is. Yeah, it's a nice piece of jewelry. Where did he give it you? Soon after we were married. But it was only secondhand. How did you know? There's an inscription to someone else inside. It says from CB to AB. From CB to AB? How very odd. What are these spaces here for? Well, there were some beads in it, but they were all loose and falling out, so I took them out. Have you got them by any chance? Yes, I think so. I put them in the vase, on the mantel. May I see them, please? Yes, they should still be here. There should be nine altogether, I think. That's right. Yes, here they are. Yes, they're all here. Let me see. Oh, how very odd. 
My dear Mrs. Merriman, have you ever been embraced by an elderly detective in his shirt sleeves? Oh, what do you mean? Well, that is your immediate fate at this moment. Oh, my dear, dear Mrs. Merriman, don't you understand? Don't you see? No, what are you so excited about? Madam, you are looking at the Barlow rubies. These beads are 12,000 pounds worth of rubies. Take oh. a good look at them before they go to Her Majesty the Queen. And I had them all the time. I had them all the time. All because he could not resist a little common theft along with a big game. Well... It's I'm after the big game now. Uh, what time do you think he'll be back? I don't know. He's not usually in until 11. Oh, well, then, uh, we put the brooch back where we found it. On the, on the, down there, on the right. On the that's right, right. That's yes, right. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, now, I want you to go to your room. Lock your door and do not leave your room under any circumstances. Oh, please don't leave me. I have a feeling. Don't leave me. You have nothing to fear so long as you remain in your room with your door locked. Now, you'll do that, won't you? Yes, Inspector. I'll say my headache is worse. Only don't make me stay there long. I'm... I'm so afraid. You are listening to the Best Plays production of Angel Street by John Patrick. Starring Vincent Price, Judith Evelyn, and Melville Cooper, with Elizabeth Eustace and Marjorie Maud. In a moment, we will return with Act Two. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Before we resume with Act Two of John Patrick's Angel Street on Best Plays, here is John Chapman. The season of 1941-1942 had another thriller, too. It was Uncle Harry by Thomas Job, which, by the way, we'll be doing later in this series. It was wartime then, and a good many dramas dealt with national and international affairs. John Huston, the movie writer and director, collaborated on a best play called In Time to Come about Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations. John Steinbeck had a drama about Nazi brutality, The Moon is Down. Maxwell Anderson also did one about the Germans, Candle in the Wind. There was still another good war play, Letters to Lucerne. But not all of Broadway was serious. Noel Coward came up with one of his happiest comedies, Blythe Spirit, and Jerome Chodorov and Joseph Fields hit another laughing jackpot with Junior Miss. Patrick Hamilton, who was a Londoner, wrote his melodrama about Mr. and Mrs. Manningham before the war under the title of Gaslight. It was a great success in London, but it went begging in New York for two years until producer Shepard Traub took a chance on it and changed its name. A very good movie was made under the original title of Gaslight. But now we should be moving into the second act of our play, which is Angel Street. It is now 11 o'clock. In the living room of the house on Angel Street, Mr. Manningham has just returned. He enters the room and in a slow and deliberate way pulls the bell cord. After a few moments, the door opens and Nancy enters. Yes, sir? Nancy, would you please go upstairs and tell Mrs. Manningham that I wish to see her down here? If I may say so, sir, I doubt if she'll come. Elizabeth says she has an headache and is trying to sleep. Oh. Did you ever know a time when Mrs. Manningham did not have a headache, Nancy? No, sir, hardly ever, sir. Will you be so good as to come a little closer, Nancy, where I can see you? Yes, sir. What do you do with your evenings, Nancy? I usually spend them with friends, sir. You know, Nancy, when you say friends, I have an extraordinary idea that you mean gentlemen friends. Well, sir, possibly I might. You know, gentlemen friends have been known to take decided liberties with young ladies like yourself. Are you alive to such a possibility? Oh, no, sir, not with me. I can look after myself. And are you always so anxious to look after yourself? No, sir. Not always, perhaps. You know, Nancy, 
pretty as your bonnet is, it's not anything near so pretty as your hair beneath it. Won't you take it off and let me see it? Very good, sir. Comes off easy enough. There. Is there anything more you want, sir? Yes, possibly. Come here, Nancy. Yes, sir. Is there anything you want, sir? What do you want, eh? What do you want? <sighs> there. Can she do that for you? Can she do that? Why, who can you be talking about, Nancy? You know I mean, all right. You know you're a very remarkable girl in many respects, Nancy. Why, I believe you're jealous of your mistress. There's no need to be jealous of her. You're mine now, ain't you? Because you want me. You do want me, don't you? And what of you, Nancy? Do you want me? Oh, yes, I always wanted you, ever since I first clapped eyes on you. Well, Nancy, you've taken me a little by surprise. <laughs> we shall talk this over tomorrow. Well, you let me know when she's about. Oh, I'll find a way, Nancy. I don't believe Mrs. Maddingham will be here tomorrow. I... I don't think that... What is it, your lordship? Why are you looking that way? That desk drawer. Somebody's been tampering with it. See, there, the wood split. It's her, I'll be bound. Nancy... Will you please go upstairs and take a message for me to Mrs. Manningham? Yes, what do you want me to say? Will you please tell her that I wish to see her down here this instant, whether she is suffering from a sick headache or any other form of ailment? Just like that, sir. Just like that, Nancy. With the greatest of pleasure, sir. Well, Nancy? She won't come. What do you mean, she won't come? She says she can't come. She's not well enough. She's just shamming, if you ask me. Oh, really? Then she forces me to be undignified and go to her. The door's locked. I tried it, and she won't let you in. I can tell by her voice. Are you going to batter it in? No. No, perhaps you're right. <laughs> let us try more delicate means of attaining our ends. <laughs> Perhaps you will take a note to this wretched imbecile and slip it under her door. Yes, I'll do that. What are you writing to? Never uh... mind what I'm writing. I'll tell you what you can do, though, Nancy. Just go down in the basement and fetch me the little dog, will you? The dog? The dog, yes. What's the game? Never mind, just go and get it. All right. Or on second thought, Nancy, perhaps you need not get the little dog. We'll just let it be supposed we have the little dog. <laughs> Here you are, Nancy. Please go and put this note under her door. What have you written? No, nothing very much. Just a little smoke for getting rats out of holes. <laughs> Run along. You're a rum beggar, ain't you? Go along, Nancy. And after you deliver the note, I would be obliged if you will go to bed at once. Good night. Give her what for, won't you? Ta-ta. <laughs> Bella, come and sit down in this chair, please. Where's the dog? Dog? What dog? You said you had the dog. Have you heard it again? Again? <laughs> this is strange talk, Bella, after what you did to the little dog a few weeks ago. Come and sit down here. I do not wish to speak to you. I'm not well. I thought you had the dog and were going to hurt it. That's why I came down. The dog, my dear Bella, was merely a ruse to compel you to pay me a visit quietly. Come and sit down where I told you. No, I Come and sit down where I told you. That's what you want. I want quite a good deal, Bella. Sit down and make yourself comfortable. We have plenty of time. Say what you have to say. Now, you are not sitting in the chair that I indicated, Bella. What have you to say? Are you afraid of me that you desire to get so near the door? No, I'm not afraid of you. No? <laughs> then you have a good deal of courage, my dear. However, will you now come and sit down where I told you? Yes. Hmm. Hmm? Sit down. Hmm. Do you know what you reminded me of, Bella, as you walked across the room? No, what did I remind you of? A somnambulist, Bella. Have you ever seen such a person? No, I've never seen one. Haven't you 
Not that funny, glazed, dazed look of the wandering mind. The body that acts without the soul to guide it. <laughs> I've often thought you had that look, Bella, but it was never so strong as it was tonight. No, my mind is not wandering. No? When I came in tonight, Bella, I was told you had gone to bed. Yes, I've gone to bed. Then may I ask why you are still fully dressed? I don't know. You don't know? Do you know anything about anything you do? I don't know. I forgot to undress. You forgot to undress. <laughs> a curious oversight, if I may say so, Bella. You know, you give me the appearance of having had rather an exciting time since I last saw you. Almost as though you'd been up to something. Have you been up to anything? I don't know what you mean. Did you find that bill I told you to find? No. Do you remember what I said would happen to you if you did not find that bill when I returned tonight? No. No? No? The array of your mental and physical deficiencies is growing almost overwhelming. I would advise you to answer me. Well, what do you want me to say? What was it I asked you to remember? I don't understand your words. You talk round and round. My head is going round and round. It's not necessary to tell me that, Bella. I was just wondering if it might interrupt its gyratory motion for a fraction of a second and concentrate upon the present conversation. Now, please, what was it I, a moment ago, asked you if you remembered? You asked me if I remembered what you said would happen to me if I did not find that bill. Admirable, my dear Bella, <laughs> admirable. We shall make a great logician of you yet. A Socrates, a John Stuart Mill. You shall go down to history as the shining mind of your day. <laughs> that is, if your present history does not altogether submerge you, take you away from your fellow creatures, and there is a danger of that, you know. Well, what did I say I would do to you if you did not find that bill? You said you would lock me up. And do you believe me to be a man of my word? Hmm? Yet you did not find the bill I instructed you to find. No. Did you look for it? Yes. Where did you look for it? Oh, around the room. Around the room? Hmm. Where around the room? In my desk, for instance. No, not in your desk. Why not in my desk? Your desk is locked. You imagine you can lie to no, me. I'm not lying. Come here, Bella. What do you want? Now you listen to me. Your dark, confused, rambling mind has led you into playing some pretty tricks tonight, has it not? My mind is tired. I want to go to bed. Your mind indeed is tired. Your mind is so tired it can no longer work at all. You do not think you dream. Dream all day long. Dream everything. Dream maliciously and incessantly. <laughs> Don't you know that by now, you sleepwalking imbecile? <laughs> what have you been dreaming tonight? Where is your mind wandered that you have split open my desk? <laughs> What strange disease dream have you had tonight, eh? Dream? Are you saying I've dreamed? Dreamed all that happened? All that happened? When, Bella, tonight? Of course you dreamed all that happened, or rather all that did not happen. Dream? Tonight are you saying I've dreamed? How oh, have I dreamed? Have I dreamed again? Have I not told you? Oh, I've dreamed. I haven't. Don't tell me I've dreamed. Don't what tell me. What was this dream of yours, Bella? You interested me. I, 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 I dreamed of a man. I, I, I dreamed of a man. You dreamed of a man? What man did you dream of, I, I, pray? I, 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 a man that came to see me. Oh, let me rest. Let Pull me yourself rest. together, Bella. What I, man are you talking about? I, I, I dreamed a man came I to I me. I know you dreamed it, you gibbering wretch. I want to hear more about this man of whom you dream. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I dream. I, I dream. Was I any part of this curious dream of yours, Mrs. Manningham? Perhaps my presence here will help you recall it. May I ask who the devil you are and how you got in here? Well, who I am seems a little doubtful. Apparently, I'm a mere figment of Mrs. Manningham's imagination. As to how I got in, I came in, or rather, I came back. Or better still, I effected an entrance a few minutes before you... And I've been hidden away ever since. Would you be kind enough to tell me what you are doing here? Waiting for some friends, Mr. Manningham. Waiting for some friends. Don't you think you'd better go to bed, Mrs. Manningham? You look very tired. Don't you think you had better explain your business, sir? Well, as a mere figment, as a, as a mere ghost existing only in your wife's mind, I can hardly be said to have any business. Tell me, Mr. Manningham, can you see me? Hmm. No doubt your wife can, but it must be difficult for you. Now, perhaps if she goes to her room, I will vanish. And you won't be bothered by me anymore. Bella, go to your room. I shall find out the meaning of this and deal with you in due course. Yes. Go to your room, Bella. I will call you down later. I have not finished with you yet, madam. Hello? I believe you're wrong there, Manningham. I believe that is just what you have done. Done what? Finished with your wife, my friend. Who are you, sir? I have no name, Manningham. In my present capacity, I, as I pointed out, a mere spirit. 
Perhaps a spirit of something that you have evaded all your life. But in my case, only a spirit. Will you have a cigar with a spirit? We might have to wait some time. Are you going to tell me your business, sir? Or am I going to fetch a policeman and have you turned out? Well, Admiral, I dear. I could have thought of nothing better myself. Yes, yes, fetch a policeman, Manningham. Have me turned out. Huh? Why do you wait? Alternatively, sir, I can turn you up myself. Yes, but why not fetch a policeman? You give me the impression, sir, of having something up your sleeve. Would you please go on with what you were saying? Yes, sir. Uh, where was I? Yes. Excuse me, Marion. You get the same impression as myself? Impression? What impression? An impression that the light is going down in this room. I had not noticed it. Oh, there now. Perhaps it's more noticeable. Do you perceive it, Mr. Manningham? Here, isn't it? Now, we're almost in the dark. What do you think's happened, huh? You don't suppose a light has been put on somewhere else? You don't suppose there are other spirits? Fellow spirits of mine? Spirits of justice, even, which have caught up with you at last, Mr. Manning? Are you off your head, sir? No, sir, just an old man seeing ghosts. Must be the atmosphere of this house. You know one ghost I can see, Mr. Manning? You could hardly believe it. What ghost do you see, Tony? I, I see the ghost of an old woman, sir. An old woman who once lived in this house. An old woman getting ready to go to bed at the end of the day. Now I seem to see another ghost as well. I see the ghost of a young man, Mr. Manningham. Handsome, tall, well-groomed young man. But this young man has murder in his eyes. Why, bless my soul. He might be you, Mr. Manningham. He might be you. The old woman sees him. She screams, screams for help, screams before her throat is cut, cut open with a knife. What's your game, eh? What's your game? I want you to take a look at this trinket, sir. Do you recognize it? It's a brooch which I gave my wife. Hmm, Why? A brooch which she didn't appreciate, huh? How wicked of her. But then, you see, she didn't know its value. How was she to know that it held the Barlow rubies? Oh, what? Hmm, there you are, sir. Oh. You killed one woman for these and you tried to drive another out of her mind. And all the time they lay on your own desk. And all they have brought you is a rope around your neck, Mr. Sidney Power. You seem, sir, to have some very remarkable information. Do you imagine that you are going to leave this room with such information in your possession? Do you imagine, sir, that you are going to leave this room without suitable escort? May I ask what you mean by that? Only I have men in the house already. Didn't you realize they had signaled their arrival from above? Your own way in, Mr. Manningham, when the lights went down? You failed to intimidate me, sir. I do not believe you. Then perhaps you'll be convinced if you will open the doorway to the hall. You will find two policemen there. What the devil's this? Uh, take it, gentlemen. Here! Here you go! Leave go of me! Leave go of me! Here's a fine way of going on. Here's a fine Here's the bell cord. Here, tied with him. Go of me! Sidney Charles Power, I have a warrant for your arrest for the murder of Alice Barlow. I should warn you that anything you may now say will be taken down in writing and used as evidence at a later date. Now, will you accompany us to the station in a peaceful manner? You will oblige us all and serve your own interests best by coming quietly. No. Very well, take him away. Inspector Off. Yes, my dear? Inspector. Yes? I want to speak to my husband. Oh, surely there's nothing to be... I want to speak to him alone. Alone? I beg of you to allow me. I shan't keep him long. Well, I don't quite understand, but... All right, very well. You may speak to him alone. Make him fast in this chair. Yeah. Yeah. It's anything but in order, but, uh, well, we'll wait outside. I do not want you to listen. No, we will not listen. All right, gentlemen, outside. Jack. Jack, what have they done to you? What have they done? It's all right, Bella. You're clever, my darling, terribly clever. <laughs> Now, get something to cut this rope. I can get out through the dressing room window and make a jump for it. Can you get something, Bella? Yes, I can get something. What can I get? There's a razor in my dressing room, Bella. Will you get it for me? Quick, Bella. Quick, be a good girl. There's a good girl. Quick, Bella, be quick. Be quick. Hurry, Bella, hurry. I got it. I got it. Yes. Yes. Open the case, Bella. Open it and cut me loose. Yes. There's a grocery bill. The grocery bill was in your razor case. You see, dear, I didn't lose it. I told you I didn't. Cut me loose, Bella. But, Jack, how did this bill get in there? I was mistaken about the grocery bill, Bella. Use that razor quick. What? Razor? Huh? Razor? 
Are you suggesting this is a razor I hold in my hand? Have you gone mad, my husband? Bella, Bella, what are you up to? Or is it I who am mad? Yes, of course, that's it. It's I who am mad. Uh -oh. Of course it was a razor. I've lost it. I've lost it, haven't I? No, the razor's lying at your feet, Bella. I'm bring always it here. losing things. I can never find them. I don't know where I put oh, them. Oh, Bella. I must look for it, mustn't I? I don't find it. You lock me in my room. No. You lock me in the madhouse for my mischief. No. Where could it be now? Could it be behind the picture? No. It must be there. No. no, it's not there. How strange. Oh, where now shall I look? Where shall I... The desk. Perhaps I put it in the desk. No. It's not there. How strange. But here's a watch. Here's a bill. See, I found them at last. They don't help you, do they? Mm. I'm trying to help you, aren't I? To help you to escape. No. How can a mad woman help her husband to escape? Oh. What a pity. If I were not mad, I could have helped you. If I were not mad, whatever you had done, I could have pitied and protected you. No. But because I'm mad, I've hated you. No. Because I'm mad, I've betrayed you. No. Because I'm mad, I'm rejoicing in my heart. Without a shred of pity, without a shred of regret. No. Watching you go with glory in my heart. Bella. 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 Take this man away. Take this man away. Bella. All right, gentlemen. They'll remove him. Elizabeth, quick. Yes. Glass of water, Mr. Manningham. Yes, there, 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 my dear. Now, come, 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 sit down. I had a bad time. I came in from nowhere and gave you the most horrible evening of your life. The most horrible evening of anybody's life, I should imagine. Most horrible. No, the most wonderful. Far and away the most wonderful. have just heard the best plays production of Angel Street by John Patrick, starring Vincent Price, Judith Evelyn, and Melville Cooper, with Elizabeth Eustace and Marjorie Maud. And here is your host, drama critic John Chapman, with a closing word. Good old Sergeant Ruff. Mrs. Manningham certainly wasn't a lucky woman, wasn't she? I'd like to thank Miss Evelyn, Mr. Price, and Mr. Cooper for an exciting performance. Next Sunday, the best play of this series will be The Hasty Heart by John Patrick. And this will be another change of pace for us. It is an interesting work, basically a comedy, but with an undertone of compelling sentiment. It's about a wounded soldier and a nurse who brings this boy to a new enjoyment of life. Ann Burr played the nurse in the original production of this best play, and she will act it again next Sunday. John Sylvester will be the young soldier. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. Angel Street was adapted for radio by Earl Hamner. Vincent Price was Mr. Manningham, and Judith Evelyn was Mrs. Manningham. Melville Cooper was Sergeant Ruff, Elizabeth was played by Marjorie Maud and Nancy by Elizabeth Eustace. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King. Your announcer is Howard Reed. Can you stop your car in time? Ask yourself that question the next time you're on the highway. If the car in front of you should jam on his brakes to avoid a stray dog, if a child should dash across an intersection, if a tire should blow out, could you stop in time to save a life?